How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on the show, we explore plastics in the ocean and coral bleaching. I'll talk to the sea's biggest heroes about the threats facing the world's oceans. It's just devastating, about 90% gone of the Great Barrier Reef. It's, it's shocking. And 2016 marks the 100th anniversary of America's national park system. But are we doing everything we can to protect our national treasures? The principle of wildness needs our support everywhere, in the park, in the backyard. But first, Uber announced it's teaming up with Volvo and launching its first autonomous cars. We take you on a journey through the history of the electric car to the birth of the autonomous vehicle. Industry experts are here to explain what it all means for emissions reductions goals. Let's face it, we're on a tight timeline here with, with global warming. We've got to ratchet it up. Up next on Climate One. We're pleased to welcome three EV experts to talk with our live audience here at the Commonwealth Club today. Ten years ago, Sherry Boschert wrote a book titled Plug-In Hybrids, The Cars That Will Recharge America. She's a co-founder of Plug-In America, an advocacy group. Eileen Tutt is executive director of the California Electric Transportation Coalition, a group of companies in the electric vehicle industry. And Charlie Vogelheim is host of Motor Trend Audio, a weekly podcast. Please welcome them to Climate One. Sherry Boschert, why don't you give us a quick history lesson? Uh, in the 1990s, California decided they, uh, regulators decided they should push something uh, called zero emission vehicles. And from that chapter to about 2011, there were what, six or 7,000 of those cars sold. So give us that quick historic foundation since you lived through that era. Sure, and, and the reason this is important, uh, the California Air Resources Board started requiring car makers to make cleaner cars if they wanted to keep doing business in our state. That is one of the reasons we have these cars today. The car companies didn't want to do that. Uh, one of the other reasons is that consumers have been pushing them. Um, but to give you a sense of the back and forth and how long this has taken, uh, in 1990, General Motors displayed an electric vehicle called the Impact. Not a good name. Uh, they later called it the EV1, electric car. Having shown that they could build an electric car, even though it was sort of a concept, the California Air Resources Board then required the top seven automakers to make 2% of their sales in the state be zero emission by 1998, 5% by 2001, and 10% by 2003. We're nowhere near that right now, but those were really great goals, and it freaked out the car companies completely. Um, in 1991, 19 states adopted parts of California's regulations. So now you've got a movement that really is pushing car companies. Uh, the car companies fought back. Uh, they kept suing. Um, in the early 2000s, the Bush administration, uh, you know, basically backed the car companies. And the California Air Resources Board decided that they had to water down the regulations, that they couldn't keep up the fight or they, there was a the potential to lose. And so in 2001, the Air Resources Board cut the zero emission vehicle mandate uh, to 2% of sales and they kept scaling it back and scaling it back. There was a movie made about this which people can watch the sort of the electric car kind of got pushed and then killed, right? Uh, and then we get to 2011 where kind of there's a, there's a new generation of electric cars that comes onto the market, right? Okay. Yeah, and if so. you haven't seen the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? It tells the whole story and, and it's, even if you're not a car person, it, it um, frames it as a murder mystery. Who killed the electric car? Was it the Air Resources Board backing down? Was it the car companies? Was it the oil companies? Did consumers not want them? Or did hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell cars distract everyone? So it's a really entertaining movie and was followed by another movie called Revenge of the Electric Car when the electric cars came back. A lot of that in my book gives you a lot of background uh, that explains why we're where we're at today. You know, we have the cars, but not as many as we should. And we need to keep pushing, and government regulators need to keep pushing. 
An interesting thing there, you said that we're b below even where people, um, this started 25 years ago, and the, where the market uh, a share of electric cars today is below where regulators wanted to be 15 years ago. Tell us about the state of the market. Uh, you've driven, there's what, 22 or 25 cars on the market now with a plug. Tell us about the, the there range. There are now, of, and, and yeah. certainly, again, it, it, it's both the all-electric and then the plug-in electric, as you're saying, which are you know, versions of a hybrid vehicle. And I think a lot of the promise with electric cars is that we all believe, and there, I still do, and, and many of the engineers, that there's going to be a breakthrough, there's going to be that opportunity. But in the end, uh, for a lot of people, the fact that in an affordable electric car will go at or under 100 miles on a charge, it offers a little bit of range anxiety still. I mean, we're all trying to get to point A to point B, and we're storing the power, in this case in the form of electricity, in this case in the form of a battery. Unfortunately, that is hard to compete against. The, the, the greatest stored power that we know or that we can derive is, is a gallon of diesel fuel. Um, again, that's not necessarily something to aspire to, uh, but to the extent that until we can get the battery capabilities up a little bit more and or the cost a little bit lower, that's what we have to you know, bang up against. Eileen, you have some teenage drivers in your house. How do that teenagers are often anxious uh, about life and lots of things? Uh, how do they deal with a range anxiety? Because when you first go electric, you're kind of like, oh, I'm not so sure. Am I going to run out of gas? So how did your family deal with range anxiety? Well, for anybody who has a teenager out there, this is not going to shock you. They loved taking those cars right up to the edge. And my daughter and son would bring home that car and it would have one mile. In fact, <laughs> one time I, my son pulled up and the car shut down right as he was at zero. So they th that is so exciting to a teenager. It's like one more risk that they can take and your mom isn't going to kill you for it. So yeah, there was range anxiety was simply a non-issue for my teenagers. I will also say, that they've never lived in a household that didn't have an electric car. That's, that's all they really know is, and they, ha they don't like gasoline cars because as Charlie was saying, there's just so many benefits to driving an electric car that you don't think about. And if you're a kid, you really notice the difference. Like they loved the quiet. My daughter gets very car sick. She has some real issues with car sickness. She doesn't get car sick in an electric car and she's certain it's because the gasoline is killing her, right? So it's it, the benefit, they don't have a transmission if you haven't driven an all-electric car, you may not know this, there's no transmission. So there's the maintenance on these cars is pretty much zero, which is another good thing if you have a teenager. Uh, I'd like to turn to autonomous cars, another thing on the horizon. Uh, Eileen, uh, some people are looking at uh, autonomous cars as a boost for electric cars because in some ways, some people have said there's challenges for autonomous cars being internal combustion engine. Um, how's that going to change? Uh, is that going to put some wind in the sails for electric cars when Google and Apple start making cars? Because we probably think they're not going to be making gasoline cars or we're not sure. Well, I mean, I guess that's really interesting, and I'm going to ask everyone who's listening today to write to Google, because as far as I can tell right now, their autonomous cars, well, they all are using gasoline. Oh, so okay. they have not, and they haven't really, and we've wanted them, and they, they're very green. They have this, they want to be seen as green, which may be why a lot of people think those cars are electric. But we need them to, we need them to use electricity, and in all honesty, I hope that the regulators have some requirement on autonomous cars because the, the autonomous cars, and I think Charlie, you probably would agree, but I, I'm, I'm not as well educated about cars as you are, but my sense is that um, autonomous cars and electric vehicles go hand in hand. And I, I told my husband, I don't want to buy another car until it drives itself because I'm not, I don't enjoy driving. I, I, the only thing I care about a car before they made electric ones was what color it was. I have, I have zero interest in driving. If somebody else will drive, I'm much happier. I would much rather my car drove without anybody driving it. Um, so I'm happy. I would love to have an autonomous car. And I think a lot of people feel that way. So if we required uh, autonomous cars to be also electric cars, then I think we have a much better chance of really breaking into the market. Because to be honest, people love their cars now. They, they really love the product they have. They're not all that interested in a, in a car that just uses a different fuel. They, they don't feel the difference necessarily until they drive the car. But for the most part, 
you know, people are really satisfied <clears throat> with the products that are out there. So I hope, I hope all autonomous Although cars unli are Although like unlikely that Sacramento or the federal government's gonna dictate to yeah. car companies what kind of fuel they, that would also run against the libertarian streak in Silicon Valley. I don't see that happening. Well, Jerry they Washer. may not dictate the fuel. I mean, they studiously tried not to do that, which is why we have this fiction of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles being viable. Um, but they are willing to regulate emissions and they are willing to regulate you know, things that contribute to global warming. So the idea of all these cars being gas, they're gonna have to be more and more and more efficient gas or hybrids or then plug-in hybrids or all electric. You might as well make them all electric from the start. Um, besides which, you know, there's all the electronics in the car that the young people these days, and us oldsters too, that we like. We like the iPad console on the Tesla. We like having the interactive Bluetooth and everything else, the self, parking and all of this. So that's much more amenable, I would think, to an electric car. But so the government regulators are willing to regulate emissions. They need to do a faster and tighter job. I mean, l let's face it, we're on a tight timeline here with, with global warming. We've got to ratchet it up, whether it's regulations or whether it's consumers demanding. And I'm hoping the young people are more willing to, man, to demand cleaner cars. Charlie Vogelheim, autonomous cars, that's gotta be pretty exciting for someone in the, uh, in the auto uh, media uh, industry as you are. Um, how are they gonna shake up the industry and are they gonna result in more electrics? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I, again, uh, all of the automakers are working on, on a version. Every of the major automakers has a lab down in Silicon Valley. The, the major suppliers, Delphi, uh, have an, uh, you know, they have an autonomous car. It's, if you look at the, uh, the Google cars, for the most part, their early fleets are modified Lexus vehicles, so they're internal combustion engines. They may or may not be hybrid, but for the most part, uh, Mercedes has all of, you know, the, it, it is an internal combustion engine for now. And again, let's face it, on electric cars, and particularly all electric, the other thing about the battery, and, and I really would love to talk more about hydrogen, but it, it doesn't fill as quickly. We all know that how quickly we can fill a tank with a liquid. There's th things about liquids that just, they move quickly and they, they come in and they come out and they can take on uh, any number of shapes. Unfortunately, electricity takes a little bit of time. If you get into autonomous cars, like autonomous Uber cars, you think of the miles that they're going to put on those, unless you could do a battery swap, you just don't have time to recharge these if they're going to be utilized throughout the day. And that's obviously a consideration, and it's been demonstrated in some areas like with the Tesla and battery swaps, and that, again, might be a very viable solution, but that's a, another consideration in time, terms of uh, time to refuel. Charlie Vogelheim, what do you see in the product pop pipeline? What exciting cars are we gonna see on the road the next three to five years that are either electric or some kind of hybrid? Uh, are we gonna see some cool new stuff coming our way? Well, there's some very cool stuff, but I, I, I gotta say I'm very excited about the Bolt coming out. And you know, we talk about the Leaf. I was excited when the Leaf came out for the simple fact that it is a mass marketed all electric car. And everybody's making noise. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna be great? We can't have electric range anxiety. Until they did it, until people had them and were driving them in numbers, then we got to find out what that was all about. AAA in Southern California has a truck specifically for electric cars to catch any and all that are stranded because of range anxiety. They've never used it. The early adopters seem to understand range and seem to, to be able to work around that. I'm excited about the Bolt because it is designed from the bottom up. Uh, there's an interesting relationship General Motors has now. They've invested in Lyft. The shape and size of that car lends it towards the shared car economy. So now it enters with some type of volume, with some type of utilization. It continues the conversation and the realities of using these electric cars. So I'm excited about that as, as the next step. We should say that that's a $35,000 car, 200 mile range, similar to the Tesla Model 3. Should also mention that General Motors is the sponsor of the Climate One podcast. We're gonna go to our uh, lightning round right now and ask our uh, mm -hmm. panelists, our guests, uh, brief yes or no questions, starting with Eileen Tut. Uh, providing charging stations for electric cars is a lousy standalone business, yes or no? No. Uh, governments and other institutions, Eileen, governments and other institutions should provide it as a utility or amenity. Absolutely. Thank uh, you the, to the Public Utilities Commission in California, by the way. <laughs> Sherry Bosher, traditional car dealers want to strangle Tesla in its crib because it challenges their business model, yes or no? In their dreams, yeah. <laughs> Charlie Vogelheim, the Toyota Prius is often called a halo car, and like many things with a halo, it is not much fun. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Sherry Boschert, some EV advocates are so rabid they sometimes foam at the mouth. I, I haven't seen it, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, Eileen Touch, Arnold Schwarzenegger's hydrogen highway was a bunch of hype that never went anywhere. I worked for the man. I'm not answering that question. <laughs> Sorry, Greg. <laughs> you could walk through the door. Um, last one, Charlie Vogelheim. Romance in an electric car is more exhilarating. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That ends our lightning round. How do they do? I think they did pretty well. <laughs> Let's go to our audience questions. We invite you to join the conversation by going to the microphone in the back. Oh, hi, uh, Gerald Harris. Uh, Am Amory <clears throat> Levin once mentioned that about 6% of the energy in gasoline actually gets to running, turning the wheels. Uh, isn't it possible that ultra-low emission vehicles and more high efficiency Gasoline vehicles could accomplish very much the same thing. If you had a 200-mile uh, internal combustion engine with very low emissions, couldn't you do a lot of what you're talking about? Charlie Vogelheim, well, Ford yeah. has kind of gone down this road trying to sort of turbocharge the internal combustion engine rather than go electric and hybrid. So Yes, yeah, there's been some remarkable advancement. And, and I'm not going to uh, pick the numbers because I don't have them in front of me, but your point is well taken in that the internal combustion engine is inherently inefficient in terms of all of the friction that occurs every step of the way, from the pistons, through the drivetrain, through the transmission, to the, to the, to the wheels. So part of the problem about that is, and again, the, the advantages to electric is you can put the electric motors right at the wheels and you lose everything in between. Uh, so uh, it's been, it has been amazing in terms of the advancements of internal combustion capabilities over the last couple of years. You're talking about EcoBoost is what Ford calls it, SkyTrack is what Mazda calls it. They're doing remarkable things. The four-cylinder engine on the Mustang right now has over 300 horsepower. The best V8 you could buy in the original Mustang didn't have that much horsepower. So it, it is remarkable, but it's still an internal combustion engine. In the end, it's still burning a fossil fuel, and if it's about the tailpipe emissions, then it's still not achieving what we have. The good news is it's just using less fuel along the way. Thank you for that question. Let's go to the next question in Climate One. Hello, my name is Darren Overby. I just wanted to offer a quick testimonial about electric vehicles. I drive a 14-year-old 2002 RAV4 EV. It has 137,000 miles on it. <laughs> Everything is original except for a $100 capacitor that it was changed early in its life and the tires. And there's never been a maintenance light. There's no oil changes, no air filters. All of those maintenance costs that people associate as normal with a gasoline car, you don't do it. There's, and I will never go back to a gasoline car again. Up next, our oceans are in a state of peril, but perhaps there's something we can do about it. Today we're going to sea with three people who have spent their lives exploring and protecting the world's oceans. Liz Taylor is president of DOER Marine, an Alameda-based company that builds robots and other vehicles for deep sea exploration. She grew up learning about the sea with her mother, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle. Peter Wilcox is the former captain of the iconic Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior that was sunk by French government agents in 1985. Steve Wilson is director of campaigns at the Story of Stuff, an education and advocacy group based in Berkeley. Please welcome them to Climate One. <laughs> Liz Taylor, uh, tell us what you're seeing below the sea in the oceans about climate impacts. How is climate change changing the oceans? Well, we're seeing a lot of it happen in terms of the, just the ocean temperatures. We were looking at this, this great bleaching that's going on in the Great Barrier Reef right now. Um, just devastating, about 90% gone of the Great Barrier Reef. It's, it's shocking. Can it come back? There, there's hope that it, parts of it can come back. It depends on how long the surface temperature is sustained at a, at a high rate. Um, with the remotely operated vehicles and human-occupied vehicles that, that we are developing, we're able to go down into deeper water and see if some of these corals are coming back, if they're more resilient where the water is cooler instead of just being at the surface. There's some discussion about transplanting uh, corals from deeper water back into shallower water as temperatures cool. We're trying to collect them and then rear them in captivity, the same way that some other endangered species have been saved. Now we're looking at even being able to do that for corals. But, it's, but it is quite shocking to see these sudden changes um, happening, just, you know, we're all witnesses to it. 
I would like to add to Liz's story that we were down on the Great Barrier Reef three years ago and got a chance to talk to the scientists from Townsville who know coral. And they were hypothesizing that within 15 to 20 years, the waters would be too warm and acidic to support coral growth. And here we are, three years later, with major sections of the reef gone. And that's the one constant that's in climate change, is that you make a prediction Two or, three years later, two or three years later, you can tear it up and start all over again. It's happening faster. Why, does, why is coral so, so important as the base of the food chain? Why is that so important, Liz? <clears throat> well, it's, I mean, the, pl the plankton is really the base of the food chain, but the, the coral contributes to that when they spawn. They're, all their little uh, coralettes <laughs> are, are, are waterborne into the, into the planktonic uh, soup that's there. But beyond that, they are a very important barrier to storm damage. They're one of the first lines of defense that we have. So we have all this coastal development. Most of the population lives within 50 miles of the coast uh, around the world. And so if, if we're tearing down things like mangroves and coral reefs are dying, that just opens the door for these huge storm surges to, to race in much further in than they would have in the past. So the coral reef helps to calm the storm conditions ahead of them reaching the shore. Um, and so they're, they're very critical for that reason. And just the, the myriad of fish that they support, all kinds of different fishes there. And lots of people, subsistence farmers, rely on that fish, uh, so it gets to people pretty quickly. Steve Wilson, wh what is an average American and their lifestyle, what are some of the most impactful things that we do as consumers that get to the oceans? You know, really, uh, I work on plastics in the ocean because I, I like to think of it as the visual evidence of climate change, about 10% of petroleum uh, products go to the production of plastics. Interestingly, with coral, coral is filter feeders and fibers from synthetic clothing that come off in the washing machine. About every load of laundry have about 1,900 fibers uh, going out into uh, the ocean. Uh, ultimately, coral is choking on this too. So they're, they're kind of getting a one-two punch from acidification and synthetics. And the, the footprint of plastics per capita in the United States is about 326 pounds of plastic per person per year, 50% of which is single-use plastics. So if you want to talk about the most impactful, not only um, uh, problem, but also uh, empowering device, is getting out of single-use plastics, you can literally reduce 50% of your footprint overnight. You know, listening to these folks to my right, uh, uh, I'm aware that as people on the planet, we don't take good care of the oceans. We don't pay the first attention to them. A farmer living, living at home would never treat his farm the way we treat the oceans. We constantly overfish. We constantly fish a species to decimation, and then we move on to the next one. And Greenpeace believes that the oceans are a resource that need to be shared by everybody and can produce a lot of food for everybody. But when we overfish a species into extinction, we're destroying the resource. And we've done this over and over and over again. Most recently, we have wiped out the tuna by three quarters of their normal population. And that's not the way to get the most food out of the ocean. But there's no regulations on the high seas, and that's something we desperately need to change. Liz Taylor, is sustainable aquaculture or farming, is there a way, what's the way to do it right in terms of to utilize uh, the ocean's bounty for humans without overdoing it? Well, first of all, we need to stop treating the ocean as a supermarket and a sewer at the same time. That's kind of fundamental. But beyond that, it's really looking at, do we want to continue this kind of trade in global wildlife? Uh, you know, we're, we're shipping fish all around the world. We have tuna that are caught off the coast here or caught elsewhere and they're shipped overnight to a fish market in Japan. It's a huge carbon footprint. Um, it seems a, a more logical way to fish locally, fish with artisanal methods, uh, hook and line, um, <clears throat> not to have these, these massive commercial trawling operations going on. The, the McDonald's filet of fish sandwich supports the largest trawler, a ship more than 400 feet long um, in the Bering Sea. That, that just takes metric tons of pollock <laughs> out of the environment. And you know, how does that affect the other animals that rely upon that food source? I've read that even there's fish caught off the coast of the United Kingdom 
sent to China for processing and then back to the UK for fish and chips. So if that right. Yeah. So I mean, the answer is to to know where your fish comes from, know you're a fishmonger, make sure that the met methodology used is uh, as low impact as possible, and for the farm fish. Um, you know, maybe bring it on shore in these closed systems. Don't, don't be discharging things directly into the ocean or feeding antibiotics to fish that are pinned in the ocean. Um, you could be doing it on shore. Peter Wilcox, do you eat fish? I do more and more <laughs> reluctantly every, uh, all the time. Um, I haven't eaten meat for 40 years because uh, I read how President Reagan was signing a special bill every year allowing, allowing beef farmers to use steroids and hormones to grow their beef, yet he was serving organic beef at the White House, so he <laughs> knew better. That made me so mad I gave up on meat. And now I listen to these folks and I realize that even wild-caught fish are created, contain a high number of amount of plastics. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how much longer I will. There was even a report recently about cocaine found in salmon off uh, the coast of the Seattle. West. Seattle. Yeah, the NPR report. Right. Uh, Steve Wilson, what did you think about when you heard that story? Well, I was wondering how they, you know, they get up these very rough streams <laughs> to spawn. And now it seems to make sense. <laughs> um, and how about your personal diet? Uh, I don't eat fish, uh, and that largely comes from, you know, when, when you're sailing across an ocean, you often just have a line dragging, you know, if you can catch a Dorado or a tuna, and... You know, we would get to these very remote places in the South Pacific with these reef systems and there'd be no fish. And there'd be tons of plastic on the beach, but no fish. And it just, and there was, there's one, in, one atoll in the South Pacific called Henderson, which is actually where Herman Melville got the idea for Moby Dick uh, from chasing uh, a whale there. And, and I, you know, swimming to shore, I was like, this should be, Shangri-La, this should be the Jacques Cousteau video that I saw when I was a kid, and there was nothing there. I want to go to our uh, speed round, lightning round, <laughs> and ask a couple, some quick questions of each of our guests today at Climate One. Uh, Steve Wilson, bans on plastic bags, this is yes or no. Steve Wilson, bans on plastic bags are feel-good measures that don't address bigger threats to the ocean. False. Liz Taylor, most, <laughs> you do work with industry, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, Liz Taylor, most offshore oil wells are operated safely and responsibly. Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, when we'll get to Peter Wilcox's uh, vacation in Russia. Uh, Peter Wilcox, is the food in the Russian jails better or worse than the food in American jails? I, I, fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> I you haven't know been in that many American jails. Um, <laughs> Maybe some of your Greenpeace colleagues here in the audience have. Uh, uh, Peter Wilcox, is Siberia a good place for a vacation? I wasn't in Siberia. I was in uh, Murmansk, which is the only ice-free port Russia has on the northern shore. And I was in St. Petersburg. Okay, so we'll get to that story. Um, this is a w quick word association. If I mention a word, just what pops into your mind first? Don't need to explain it. Just the association is what we're looking for. Uh, Peter Wilcox, SeaWorld. Orcas. Liz Taylor, the actress Liz Taylor. <laughs> Still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Stiv Wilson, diesel-powered yachts. I have a gas-powered yacht. Uh, some sailors call them stink pots. Uh, the uh, Peter Wilcox, the Ocean Protection Group, Cease Shepherd. Uh, good group. I don't appreciate their uh, sometimes use of violence. Peter Wilcox, bluefin tuna. Threatened in their existence. Liz Taylor, the U.S. Navy. Uh, they'd like a, a better white front door <laughs> uh peter wilcox french food excellent <laughs> french agents not so smart <laughs> okay that ends our lightning round how they do i think they did pretty well let's give them a <laughs> round for getting through the um who are some of your sea heroes liz taylor 
Who are adventurers that you look to, people that are protecting and stewarding the oceans? Well, increasingly, I think we're seeing real uh, heroism from citizen scientists, uh, people that are every day trying to go out and make a positive change, whether they're staging a beach cleanup or they're a sailor that's looking for ghost fishing gear or they're contributing um, to the different NGOs and trying to keep them going and just making good personal choices, educating themselves. And what are some technologies that are enabling them to do that? Well, certainly we're seeing uh, the internet is a, is a huge thing. You know, we, we worked at, at DOER Marine, we worked for three years with Google on the Google Ocean layer in Google Earth. And we converted it from being Google Dirt to being Google Ocean, the whole thing. Because <laughs> it initially so, just had land, not the ocean. Exactly, okay. the ocean was left out in the beginning. Uh, but we worked with them uh, and with the US Navy, so it was kind of a three-way team with a cooperative research and development agreement, and we brought in partners from around the world to add their content into that platform. And, and I think it's a, something that will continue to grow that will have the ability for more people to add um, their adventures, their observations, and to have this big searchable um, encyclopedia for the, for the world. It could be very powerful. Peter Wilcox, uh, marine protected areas are one of the, the positive stories in the ocean. There are basically national parks in the oceans, and some of it, uh, people would say that they've actually come back. Some of those areas signed uh, into law by George W. Bush. Uh, do you see that as one of the, the bright hopes in, in the ocean of we can set some areas off limits and maybe they'll, they'll come back? Well, we have to respect the ocean. That's the start. And marine protected areas are an excellent way to do it. We haven't nearly done enough. Uh, we're still decimating the life in the oceans by overfishing. Uh, everything else we do, our activities are not congruent with protecting the ocean. Marine protected areas are a good way to start, but we haven't done nearly enough of them. Liz Taylor, marine protected areas? Well, it's like you're saying, they, we really need to do a lot more. Uh, one of the goals is, the loftier goals is 20% by 2020 for ocean protection. But you know, we see marine protected areas, and, and we have a lot of them right along our own coast here, the marine sanctuaries, Cordell Banks, Gulf of the Farallons, um, and yet fishing is still allowed in those areas to some extent. So we really need areas where these animals can just be left alone. And there'll be plenty of fishing outside the boundaries, but we need to spend more time in the ocean directly observing to understand where the real key areas are for breeding, for resting, um, similar to what Ducks Unlimited did on the, on the land, where they, they went out, they observed, they saw this is where the ducks are breeding, we need to protect these areas, and yet a hunter can still go out and, and take a few ducks, but we don't have commercial duck hunting anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. Steve Wilson, uh, you've been out to the, the plastic gyres, uh, these garbage patches. Uh, can they come back to life? You're a plastics expert. Yeah, I mean, this will astonish you, but... People talk about the garbage patches as being the final resting place. The plastic will never escape there, and it's there in perpetuity. The good news is it's actually when these gyres rotate. Uh, takes, the North Pacific gyre takes about three years to rotate. It spits out about 50% of its contents. That's either going to enter another gyre or wash up on land. So, I mean, hopefully what, what I say is, Beach cleanup is gyre cleanup. If, if you are capturing that stuff before a surge or a storm puts it back into the ocean, you have effectively cleaned the ocean. So the, the key is we need to stop it going in. I mean, the first thing you do when a bathtub is overflowing is you turn off the faucet. And, and that's what we need to do is turn off the spigot, and then the ocean will take care of itself. The, the best thing to do for the ocean, it seems, is to leave it alone, <laughs> and it'll figure itself out. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you. Uh, Steve, I'd like to ask you about the plastics. Um, a little while back, there was some young kid, a, a brilliant kid, who supposedly invented a machine that was going to scoop it all up. Uh, so I have two questions. One. Is some of the plastic gone to the bottom of the ocean and is it going to stay there forever or is, is it going to be eaten by the fish and how bad is it in the food chain? And then um, the other question is, how does all that plastic get in the ocean? Where is it coming from? Cruise ships or is it blowing offshore or coming out of rivers and into the ocean? Thank you for the question. Steve Wilson. Well, luckily, Liz is inventing machines to go get it all off the bottom. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, the, the sad truth is a lot of this, pla half the plastics 
we use sink. So we don't really have much data on what's on the bottom of the ocean. Um, in Liz's work, she was talking earlier about seeing a lot of this stuff uh, down there, um, both at depth and in nearshore environments. Uh, with regard to how it gets there, this is really a story of, of death by a thousand cuts. It's every river, it's every stream, uh, it's every cigarette butt. I mean, there's seven and a half billion people on the planet and and you know they're using a lot of plastic and some of it escapes the waste stream especially in developing countries we're working very hard with a an international team to develop a strategy for five southeast southeast asian countries that equate uh, or that account for about 80% of what goes into the ocean because of poor waste management infrastructure. Um, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that this is going to be really successful. we got some really interesting zero waste models um, by, by creating value to the plastic at the end of life from a recycling standpoint. With regard to cleaning it up, um, if you Google my name and the fallacy of cleaning the ocean gyres of plastic, um, you will see I've written pretty extensively on this. Let's go to our next question at Climate One. Thanks. Um, the three of you touch and go into the ocean almost, I would say, pretty much on a daily basis. Uh, do you have any suggestions about people at home, maybe from flyover states who don't necessarily get to see the ocean on a daily basis, about how they can bit, get more involved and more impactful? Well, I think Liz that, Taylor. yeah, I think everyone has the ability to be very impactful, whether it's a decision to, uh, you know, tear out their lawn and put in native plants, whether it's a decision to um, just make those choices. The single-use plastic <clears throat> is by far, I think, the largest uh, choice that people can make, whether they live in a completely landlocked area. If you have your your soda bottle and it goes into a, a lake and then it goes to the creek and then it goes to the stream and it goes down river, it's going to get to the ocean in due course. So every choice we make every day, uh, we have that, that opportunity to make a difference. Up next, it's America's National Park Centennial Celebration. Find out some of the surprising happenings that have been going on inside. Joining our live audience, we're pleased to have with us two authors with deep knowledge of America's efforts to preserve and manipulate nature. Jordan Fisher Smith worked for 21 years as a park ranger in California, Wyoming, Idaho, and Alaska. John Hart writes prolifically about beauty and nature in Northern California and beyond. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thank you. Uh, for decades, the establishment of uh, national parks was about setting aside beautiful remote places like Yellowstone or Yosemite, far from urban centers. But as examined in the documentary Rebels with a Cause, that started to change in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1950s. Take a listen to environmentalist Huey Johnson and narrator Francis McDormand. There are not many cities in the world that have such a remarkable landscape near a great urban center like this, free to use, I mean, you don't have to own a ranch in Northern California to enjoy walking in the wild. How did they do it? Between the 1950s and the 1970s, when California was the nation's fastest growing state and cities were gobbling up nearby forests and fields, ordinary people in the San Francisco Bay Area saved a vast stretch of coastline north of the Golden Gate Bridge for parks and farms. Their efforts fostered a national movement to preserve open spaces near where people live. That's the documentary Rebels with a Cause. John Hart, uh, you wrote a book about the creation of creation story of that, that area, Point Reyes National Seashore. So a lot of it was uh, some deals between ranchers and environmentalists. And so tell us that story and also how it uh, set something larger in motion. That story goes back in a way to the U.S. Army um, in the last century, but one, uh, because uh, the cornerstone of the vast green belt was actually set around the Golden Gate in military set-asides. And uh, there were several other phases that preserved the possibility of the green belt we have. The one we're talking about is the big addition of Point Reyes, 
Uh, and that this. was uh, got started under President uh, Kennedy. President Nixon moved it along. It was first proposed uh, in the Roosevelt era. <laughs> uh, nothing happened. Uh, it was revived in the in the late fifties. Uh, um, a local congressman, Clem Miller, is the great hero of that story. Uh, and for various reasons, uh, it was decided that. Um, it would be best uh, to leave the uh, best ranch lands in place within the boundaries of the park as working ranches. There were several reasons for this, not all philosophical. One of them was money. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't plan to buy them at first. And one of them was political. It blunted one of the sources of opposition. But nonetheless, uh, the ranches stayed and later were fully incorporated into the park. And there was quite a, a feeling uh, at a certain period in history that, that this problem had been well managed, that uh, the farms belonged in the park, that there was a symbiosis, uh, that everyone was reasonably happy. That would decay somewhat later. But it left Point Reyes as a as an anomaly in the national park system in that it, was, uh, it wasn't technically a national park. There were several varieties of system members, but it was nonetheless in the system, and it was the only large area in the system where the continuation of commercial agriculture was contemplated. And that has been a source of tension and frustration on some parts ever since. And there's current litigation going on about that, so tell us what's going on there. The environmental movement is anything but a monolith. It has many, many strains, many, many opinions about everything. And one area in which it is sharply divided is on whether um, agriculture has any place in places that are labeled parks, and specifically at Point Reyes. Uh, for decades, this controversy simmered kind of under the surface. Uh, people would say, well, we're really for the ranches, but we think the practices aren't right, or we think there should be more study. Um, recently, however, and I think healthily, the fault line has, has broken to the surface. And it's now clear that there are environmentalists who support the continuation of agriculture here, and others who are suing the Park Service who really would like it gone. So perhaps a, uh, an adjudication and, a, and a, a real decision will come out of this, Jordan Fisher political and judicial. Thank you, John Hart. Uh, Jordan Fisher-Smith, what's at stake here in terms of having a local food shed? Uh, we hear environmental... You know, I think there's something even bigger at stake, and that's like, what is the human place in nature? And I think what pushes so many buttons in this park is that it is a very unusual situation. Normally, you know, at one time, um, the first uh, Hutchings and some of the first people who secured a freehold in Yosemite Valley were growing hay down there um, and, you know, and crops to, you know, they're running a little farm down in Yosemite Valley. Um, that was later done away with. The Lamar Valley at Yellowstone, which is one of the great places to watch wildlife, at one time also had, I think, about 350 acres of hay fields that they were growing hay to feed the animals in the winter to bring back these great herds of bison and, and elk and so on. But uh, by and large, you know, parks are considered natural areas, and the presence of a, what amounts to a historic landscape of you know, almost 19th century agriculture uh, through the 20th century, these old ranch buildings and these cows that have been there since 1850s represents a real anomaly in the, in, in the national parks. And what this thing boils down to in a way is, you know, do human activities belong in parks or do we want to see, we want to drive out of San Francisco and see a kind of perfection, a kind of, you know, blank slate, a tabula rasa that amounts to what, you know, what it looked like before we were here.
And I think that at the bottom, that's where the fight is, is, you know, do human beings belong in this landscape or should we see something without human beings? And that's a common strain that you write about is making landscapes like it was before the white man came here. Even in the Presidio in San Francisco, there's a move to get out indigenous, uh, you know, get out rid of the eucalyptus trees and get things before the army came, et cetera, to make it before man messed with it. Is that? Mm. that and yet, you know, the National Park Service engages in, in landscape management of various kinds. Uh, the balds in, the, uh, on, in, in Shenandoah and some of the, these beautiful sort of high country meadows that sit up on top of the landscapes are being maintained as open areas to make sure that they resemble the historic landscape there. So, um, it, boy, this place is just, there's no end to trouble about Point Reyes. <laughs> it's not out there. I, just, I think a lot had, of you know this. It's we've like, had some, we're uh, almost afraid to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> well, they, it, it is, it is this, 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 there, there's one other park where there is considerable agriculture by in, intentionally. But uh, Point Reyes is, is very close to unique. And if this lawsuit prevails, uh, I think it will be clear that, that there will be no further such experiments in national parks. And uh, the, the identity of the national park as a place that is partly wilderness and partly uh, visitor-serving development with no other commercial activity will be solidified. I, th I, th I personally think it would be a loss, but uh, it, it would be clarifying. Has anybody ever been up to the, the I know I'm not allowed to talk to the audience at this right. point, right. <laughs> yeah. but, but uh, there's a Pierce, Pierce Point, Pierce, the Pierce Ranch at the northern end of the park, um, you know, is this bunch of buildings without people and without cows. The question is, is that the same as you know, a working ranch from the 19th century. Is there a value there? And I think some people feel that it is and some people feel it isn't, but is there a value in the, in the human pattern of making butter and cheese and, and so on within a very short range of a major metropolitan area and, 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 and people eating it there? There's a big conversation about the carbon impact of all those activities, too. Uh, we're going to go to our lightning round with uh, Jordan Fisher-Smith and John Hart. This uh, series of true or false quick questions uh, for our guest today at Climate One. So Jordan Fisher-Smith, true or false, park rangers are more likely to be assaulted on the job than agents from the Drug Enforcement Agency. Uh, as of 2000, it was 13.9 times as likely to be assaulted or injured on the job. <laughs> Uh, Jordan Fisher Smith, you, that means you secretly covered a spot on the park as a on a park ranger reality show that is a uh, a version of Border Wars, a show uh, depicting immigration officers. How did you know about this? <laughs> we have our. Uh, we have our <laughs> I'm interviewing the head of the NSA it's tomorrow. It's true, but how um, did you know? <laughs> true, true. Yeah, here at noon. No, there actually was such a show. Are you just... Border, uh, I know about Border Wars. I didn't know about Park Ranger. No, uh, they, 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 I, I was cast in some reality show that was going to be about Park... You, I thought you I just made that guessed. up. Is that, it's... Well, make some other stuff up. Right? <laughs> opposition research. How'd it go? The TV show. Well, they never produced it like most things in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, everything um, that I have down there. I, I just got a note from the person who represents me down there to do some phone meeting, but nothing ever happens, you know. Hollywood. John Hart, true or false, uh, preserving the Point Reyes National Seashore and surrounding lands helped to drive up home prices in Marin County. A uh, False. Gary Giacomini said yes in the film. I know um, he does. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jordan Fisher Smith, in 50 years, national parks will be very different than they are today. True. Uh, follow up. They will have cell phone chargers attached to the trunks of giant sequoia and redwood trees for people needing to power their smartphones. Now we'll all be running around wrapped in skins again. Uh, John Hart, right, winning two book awards from the Commonwealth Club is a highlight of your career. True. <laughs> um, <laughs> right answer. Jordan Fisher Smith, you have considered engaging in civil disobedience to pro protest destruction of America's parklands. Wow, you do a lot of research, don't you? I did consider that if they built the Auburn Dam, I might have to leave the law enforcement officers and walk over, leave my gun and everything, and walk over to the other side and sit down with the protesters. You're right. John Hart, 
True or false, climate change is worse than even your Bay Area liberal friends realize. True. <laughs> Jordan Fisher Smith, if you were president for a day, where would you create a new national park? I think I would have the national park of meaning and, you know, actual discourse. It would be a national park that would elevate the idea of language and, you know, can anybody believe what's going on right now? <laughs> In so you'd, you'd found the Commonwealth Club. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is, you're right. This is the National Park of Language. Uh, John Hart, if you were president for a day, where would you create a new national park? Nevada. I'd, I'd, do a, uh, I'd create a Great Basin National Park, which included both a mountain range and an intermountain valley with playa. Jordan Fisher-Smith, what grade would you give Sally Jewell as Secretary of the Interior? Pretty good. Uh, mainly, she stayed out of major controversy and got work done. John Hart, what grade would you give President Obama as a steward of our country's natural heritage? B. No, no great mistakes, um, some nice initiatives, um, not uh, terribly... Uh, not a great deal of oomph behind it. That ends our lightning round. Let's see, how, how do you think they did? I think they did pretty well. Let's, um, thank you. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the, the futures of, of, of national parks. Um, uh, Pokemon Go is getting people out of their homes and out into the real world. There are now more active users than the mobile versions of Pandora, Twitter, and Netflix combined. The National Park Service is actually asking people to use the app in the parks with a little caveat. Let's listen to National Park Service Director John Jarvis jumping on the Pokemon Phenom. This year, the National Park Service is celebrating its 100th birthday with a campaign called Find Your Park. We've got more than 400 places for you to find, and we know you've got to catch them all. That's National Park Service Director John Jarvis. I want to uh, just pull our audience here. Who knows what I'm talking about? Okay. Who's actually used Pokemon Go? Okay. So it's, uh, you're pretty hip. Uh, so uh, John Hart, this is clearly, there's been a problem getting young people into the parks, getting kids off the couch, away from the computer games. This appears to have, be doing that. Is it successful? Is that a good thing or is it blasphemy to the idea that you go to a national park and you got your face in a screen? Well, I'm not very sensitive to blasphemy if it doesn't hurt something in the land. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not spooked on that score. It reminds me a little bit of another uh, 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 pursuit which is just slightly alien to me, which is peak bagging, in which, uh, you know, I've always been interested in going into remote areas because the remote areas are interesting. But in peak bagging, you pick your destinations because they are, say, the highest point of a county or a school district or a wilderness or what have you. Uh, so I don't, it's not my thing, and yet it gets people to wonderful places. It makes a connection. And I'm not going to criticize anybody else's connection. Jordan Fisher Smith, is this a good thing for, for national parks? Well, this is just a very, a very smart audience. It's the Commonwealth Club. But, uh, you know, I, this nervousness about there not being future partisans of the national parks has been going on for years now. And I've heard uh, Director Jarvis talk about, you know, getting cell phone use into the parks because they're going to have them anyway. Uh, and yet, you know, the national parks are, are seeing their highest visitation rates. I mean, they're skyrocketing by all... Um, practical measures, the parks are a huge success right now, uh, regardless of, you know, I think this, there's been this general nervousness about the last child in the woods syndrome for, you know, about a decade that we're not going to have future uh, people to, to tell their Congress people to vote for these things. But boy, I'll tell you, by all accounts, they're very, they're very successful right now. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Thank you, and thank you both for your always eloquence. Um, you mentioned that Point Reyes has had uh, ranching ongoing since the 1800s, and you also mentioned that some of the conditions at parks have changed. 
including record visitation and also climate change. Um, my information is that studies at Point Reyes have shown that um, cattle at Point Reyes are responsible for 76% of the greenhouse gases at the park. And I'm just wondering what kind of intervention, if any, you think might be taken about that. Well, I hope that's for John Hart. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Susan. <laughs> John, you want to? <laughs> well, cattle do have impacts. Um, agriculture does have impacts. And uh, there's no point saying otherwise. Um, there is a countermeasure that um, is, is under discussion uh, on rangeland in general, and that is this, this um, new climate uh, or carbon reduction protocol uh, called uh, range, range composting, in which they have uh, learned by experimentation that uh, depositing a quarter to half an inch of compost on grazed land can really transform the, so the soil chemistry and the, uh, and the, 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 the gases that uh, uh, are absorbed or put out uh, to the point where conceivably, uh, if this were really widely applied and it's been accepted by the relevant authorities, uh, you could uh, zero out uh, the uh, greenhouse gas contribution from areas that are grazed. Let's go to our last question. Welcome to Climate One. So in your, in your discussion, I noticed kind of a paradox between this idea of needing to manage nature in parks to preserve that vibrant nature that we see there today, and also this idea of kind of a primordial or pristine wilderness, um, even with like previous use and um, people on that land before using it. So do you see, do you really believe that um, wilderness in its kind of uh, perfect form that we see, that we use today. Um, do you feel that that term is still useful in today's context? The word pristine? The word pristine wilderness. The word pristine is, is, is really not useful in thinking about wilderness. Uh, and it's been used by the opponents of wilderness to defeat wildernesses by saying, that isn't pristine, therefore it, it can't fall into the Wilderness Act. There's an old road running into the mine. I, I would say we do away with that. What my friend Gary Snyder likes is this word wild you know, wildness. And what we need to do to support what's about to happen, uh, the, the best outcome for what's going to happen is support wildness wherever it is, wherever it still is. The principle of wildness needs our support everywhere, in the park, in the backyard. <laughs>